Well, I love uh, the notion of uh, somehow being Metal Ark Lemon, but I'm not sure Metal Ark Lemon would like the notion of being me. Uh, I think that it has been fun to travel uh, 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 these spaces talking about ideas with these good guys. Uh, they have good ideas and uh, they raise them well. Uh, I, I think that when we think about IP and patents in particular, uh, it is worth beginning where Richard suggests we begin. We talk to the court and the court tells us, at least Justice Breyer tells us, that the pro, the benefit is, is that we're going to uh, get more stuff. We're going to get people to invent more if we have patents. And I, I think it's probably true, all other things being equal, if you put a carrot in front of a rabbit, the rabbit will move towards it. Okay, I get that. But it just turns out, if I haven't told you how many wolves there are in the room, where the wolves are, how big the carrots are, how perceptible the carrots are to the rabbit, then you just actually can't make any serious prediction about the net behavior of the rabbit. Because if the rabbit sees the wolf but not the carrot, I assure you it will run the other way. And by the way, if it doesn't, it'll get eaten. We don't care about it then anyway uh, from that point forward. So uh, we should think about patents not just as providing incentives to invent. They probably have that effect. It just turns out they're really bad uh, at being modulated and designed to cause that effect. But they're really good at doing something else that we really need to get done. And that's to encourage the many different people who have to interact with each other in order to get inventions put to use, to interact with each other in a cooperative way. Manufacturers, marketers, venture capitalists, inventors, technologists, technologists of complementary technologies, laborers, skilled and unskilled, all of those folks have to play with each other. They have to play with each other cooperatively, and patents can significantly increase their ability to contract with each other, to coordinate with each other. That is a very positive coordination story. It's a role of property rights uh, to bring people together to, dare I say, talk together. Now, Dan uh, talked about the notion of us all talking to government. And I think it's wonderful that the government chooses to listen to us. And I think it's wonderful that we have the freedom to talk to our government. But I don't understand why you want to design your entitlement system to encourage us all to talk to the government to get more or less, more for ourselves and less for our counterparties, uh, rather than talk to each other and strike deals with each other. You see, the more you encourage lobbying, the less you encourage market transacting. And they do come at a cost to each other. You, so uh, one of the things we're seeing in the patent system today, Michael talks a lot about patent failure due to notice. I think one thing we've seen is that almost every aspect of the patent system, from the rules about what can be obtained to the rules about how you can enforce, are rules that have all shifted. They've all become very <laughs> flexible and unpredictable. And flexibility sounds cool, because who wants to be Lawrence Welk? Who wants to be square and rigid and rough? Everybody wants to be cool and flexible and go surfing. And that's great. But as Richard and I have pointed out on a number of occasions, flexibility has a giant Achilles heel. The flexibility of the type that we're talking about is a flexibility that encourages everybody to rush to government and get the flexibility to bend in their direction. And that does cause a form of rent seeking, rent dissipation. That's the flock to the government to get special favors. And the government in this case is not just the administrative agencies and the legislature. It is, as Michael, I think, correctly points out, the courts. One reason you're seeing an increase in patent litigation is because patents don't mean anything until you've gone to court. Because the courts are so totally unpredictable now that until you've gone to court, you really have no sense of whether the patent will be enforced. So I think that there's a giant endogeneity to the two problems that Michael is identifying. One of his problems is people don't know what patents are, and the other problem is people are litigating, and my response is that most of the reforms we've seen in the patent system over the last several years have caused both of those effects. And most of the changes that we're seeing proposed today are going to increase those effects. So what patents can do for us is they can encourage us to transact with each other, but they're only going to encourage us to transact with each other if we actually think if we don't transact with each other, the other guy is going to actually get some meaningful enforcement mechanism against us. Now, listen, I'm a capitalist. I love money, and my bet is you do too. But it turns out 
it just turns out that these cases are not all about money. Because if every patent case were about money, and every patent license were about money, and every patent assignment were about money, they'd boil down to a single sentence, patent number, dollar amount, and maybe for customer service reasons, they'd add have a nice day as the final clause. But these are 30 or 60 or 90 page documents. And the reason these are 30 or 60 or 90 page documents is because the parties are allocating much more complicated things than money. And so the credible threat that maybe you'll get a dollar amount from a judge later really ain't worth very much. It's very cold comfort. You're not going to strike the complicated textured deals people need to strike in order to get commercialization of technology done if you know the only thing you're going to get later is some cash on the dash. You'll just boil it all down to cash on the dash up front, and you'll write single sentence patent licenses. And the problem with single sentence patent licenses and patent assignments is that they actually don't do the trick. They don't do the trick for commercialization of technology. They do do the trick for something else. So what else is going on in the patent system? Dan tells us that uh, only the small guys are being, um, uh, well, I'm trying to remember exactly how you put it. Dan was saying we should listen to the small guys. Uh, the, the big guys um, uh, want stronger, uh, longer, and bigger patents. Um, yeah, like IBM and Google and Intel, those really big companies that have been long advocating for weaker, shorter, and less patents because they're in the industry that Michael identifies, an industry that has decided that today, for its business model, it doesn't like patents. But those are very, very large established players. And they, while I, they don't like patents, they don't like the stylized version of patents, patents that are a few strong patents. They don't like that. But they love patents, and by the way, they love patent litigation. You see, because there's another benefit that Michael's not picking up in his data set, a benefit that comes to very, very large players from having a patent system characterized by very, very large numbers of very trivial or rather trivial patents. Let's imagine that those large companies would like to interact with each other to do all the things that the antitrust authorities would tell them not to do dare I say. Can you imagine someone at ADM actually picking up the phone and doing that? Of course you can imagine that, right? And you know what happens when somebody does that. The people who do that do the perp walk, they go to jail, and their shareholders pay trouble damages. And in fact, when people at large companies talk to each other, not only do they have that serious antitrust problem, they have a serious trust problem. Why are they going to believe each other? Well, patent litigation characterized by large numbers of low-value patents solves both of those problems. Big companies love a weak patent system because big companies can communicate very effectively through weak patents. They can transact with large portfolios of patents through license agreements that require them to disclose to each other cost figures and internal cost structures, and they can litigate with each other in ways that require them to swap terabytes of data through the discovery rules and sworn deposition statements that all create a very high fidelity, high bandwidth form of communication among large established players. And by the way, it solves the antitrust problem, not because the antitrust regulators aren't smart enough to step in and reject the deals, but because the antitrust re regulators, when they step in to rejigger those deals, will only be able to get the deals rejiggered. They won't get trouble damages and they won't get jail time because this will all be happening in front of federal judges tried and true. There'll be no mens rea. And so one of the things I think you're seeing with the patent system today is not only do you see a d drastic decrease in the good coordination effect you like to see where people in fact have incentives to contract with each other to get commercialization done, but you also are seeing a drastic increase in the bad coordination I just mentioned, the anti-competitive coordination that actually large established players would like to and in fact do use as a way to uh, keep uh, uh, engaging in collusive behavior. <laughs> 